good, good morning. My name is, as you mentioned, Murat Kantarjoğlu. I'm a professor at UT Dallas, University of Texas at Dallas. My research is on the intersection of uh, data mining, machine learning, security, and privacy. And this is about uh, the cyber security and data mining and machine learning. We used to call data mining, but now machine learning is more popular, so I use, uh, I make it more machine learning, I would say. Uh, but uh, this is a joint work with uh, Purdue University Statistics Boise and uh, research scientists in my group, Yan Zhou, uh, and uh, funded by US Army. Uh, and, but my goal is to really give a survey of the field. There are a couple of, of our work, of course, but most of it's not, so you will see citations. Uh, so, okay. uh, so what's the hype uh, beyond this? This is, of course, already a couple of years ago uh, from Gartner. Gartner is one of the consultancy in uh, in US who are doing uh, lots of uh, IT related predictions, suggestions. And what they are saying is that uh, big data will revolutionize the cyber security. Of course, as you see, the time has already passed. So the revolution happened, maybe not so much. But clearly there are so many startups nowadays in US trying to apply some cool machine learning technique, some cool data mining technique to cyber security. Uh, I know many, at least 10 startups in the area uh, who are funded by millions of dollars in the VC funding. So th this uh, basically uh, quite a popular area, also in this, not in the research, but the startup domain. So why, uh, why this uh, thing happening? There are actually many things happen at the same time, I think, to make it a ripe moment. Of course, uh, now there are more and more big data analytics tools out there. Uh, if you look at, for example, Apache open source th tools out there, more than, uh, if, if I haven't counted incorrectly, almost half of them are related to big data, like Apache projects, Hadoop, Spark, and so on. So there are so many big data analytics management tools out there, open source, and you can get it, uh, get, use them. So that's the reason it becomes like a killer app. Uh, cybersecurity has become a killer app for big data analytics. And of course, at the same time, there is another trend happening. By the way, please feel free to interrupt any time. I have too many slides, many, many slides, so I don't think I will be able to cover it. I would be happy to answer any questions to clarify and so on. So, now the, so in other words, the first thing is that uh, there are so many tools and lots of machine learning techniques are coming. And of course, you need data. Now, now you, have, you are getting all these uh, new data. You have many, many malware samples if you are doing malware analysis. Now almost all systems are capturing system logs, system data. And furthermore, you can gather all this data. And, and furthermore, there are more in the other domains, like in cyber physical systems and so on. You are getting all the sensor data. IoT is coming, for example, and because with IoT you will be getting more data. So now we have the data aspect happening. Of course, uh, uh, now you have lots of data, you have lots of tools, and you can't do it by hand. So what you do, you throw in machine learning, data mining, data analytics. Uh, but uh, of course, when, when we start this research, a uh, couple of, uh, I, I got my first grant after a couple of things from US Army, one of the questions came to us. Okay, you are not a machine learning person. Why we should we fund you in, in this area? So of course we need to uh, explain to them that this is different. And what's different for in the traditional machine learning sense is that uh, these uh, problems that the machine learning data mining is applied in cybersecurity have a different taste, different feeling. And this feeling, if you think about intrusion detection, uh, you can throw in fraud detection, spam, malware, and so on is that you have an intelligent adversary. So people apply data mining, machine learning techniques for many, many domains. Uh, for example, in CERN, in Switzerland, they try to apply some sort of statistical techniques to detect Higgs bosons, for example. As far as I know, those particles don't try to hide or deceive the machine learning techniques or statistical techniques. But in, these, in all of these domains, you have an attacker, intelligent attacker potentially, try to deceive all these techniques. So what, what you have is an adversary that adapts, okay? An adversary that tries to avoid being detected. So that's the 
the area that makes is different than traditional machine learning data mining techniques. And hence the focus of this talk. So what are these new challenges, what it means? Of course, there are lots of machine learning researchers looking into that, and we will cover some of those ideas. So uh, therefore, this adaptive behavior requires new solutions, and there are many work in this area trying to look at from different angles. I'll try to cover some of them. Probably I will miss some interesting ones, but at least uh, hopefully you will have a very good background or understanding if you want to dig deeper. Uh, so what's happening in a rough sense is that this is very typical uh, machine learning way of uh, looking at the world. Uh, so what happens is that you have some samples, you have some data. This can be good things like good emails, good TCP IP connections, uh, good software, and you have some bad instances. And most of the machine learning, at least the classification world of it, will try to find some way of separating them, okay, from good to bad. And usually there are assumptions. One of the standard assumptions is called IID, identically independently distributed. So in other words, like you, whatever you see to learn such models look, comes from similar distribution when you deploy which I'll try to explain a little bit more in a second. But what happens is that when you have an intelligent industry, even if you have seen this type of samples or instances in the past, in the future what may happen is that attacker may modify some of them so that they can pass this learned boundary or classifier. So now the question is how you model this phenomenon, uh, especially when you think about cybersecurity, machine learning and related topics. And this is not a, this has already been male done a lot in the past. Uh, in the early days, uh, having a Viagra in a spam email was a good indicator of spam. But very quickly, spammers learned to write Viagra in many, many different ways, if you, find, if you could find Viagra in this email, uh, so that they could bypass such classifiers. So th this was one example of the adaptive behavior the uh, attackers uh, throw in. So uh, for those who know a little bit machine learning, there are other things called like concept drift. So it's common in many machine learning settings that the concept that you try to learn changes over time. Uh, or there is something called online learning. You try to learn the concept by looking at few samples at a time. But again, the main issue is this uh, adaptive behavior. And uh, I will come back to this, but we, are, we will talk about two different type of attack or adaptive behavior by the, uh, against machine learning data mining algorithms. And also I'm going to talk about some formalizations, including some of our work that looks at this between a game between an adversary and the machine learning or data miner. And uh, that's, the, uh, that's the topics we would be covering. So again, uh, I would uh, I want to emphasize this adaptive uh, behavior. Uh, of course, what are the solution ideas? We will go much deeper on this during the next couple of hours. One idea is that you keep changing your classifier. And this is uh, so that you can adapt to your behavior to new adversary. But this is uh, not very proactive, and you always maybe be a little bit late and sometimes too late if there is a zero day attacks or new type of attacks. So the question is like, how do we model this game? How do I call it game, but how do we model this interaction adaptive attacker who try to beat the machine learning models and how machine learning models know the adaptive behavior? And then of course the question is like, when does it end if there is a game, is there a equilibrium concept? And of course, if we can, how can we reach to such a point. Uh, so our agenda is that uh, I'm going to talk about some foundational results uh, uh, about uh, what it means learning in the presence of an active adversary. Some of the early work goes into like 30, 40 years ago. Some there are like, I think I was mentioned some work from three months ago. So there's a, like a wide range of work as such in the fundamental. And then I, I'm trying to talk about some work, some samples of work that tries to make uh, machine learning techniques more resistant. And then I'm, I will try to look into 
talk about some applications to cybersecurity and some practical attacks against machine learning techniques in cybersecurity. So remember, we talk about adaptive behavior. I will give some examples. And then finally, I will talk about uh, what at least some insights that that I present to US government. So that would be the uh, last part. Again, uh, please stop me anytime if you have any questions. Uh, so what are the foundations? Uh, before I start that, that, just to be on the leveling page, I will just want to say that there are many, many machine learning techniques. And uh, there are, this is one standard textbook slide. <laughs> on what the machine learning landscape can look like. Uh, most of our focus will be on the supervised learning or classification. And the idea is that we learn a model that will distinguish good and the bad, malware versus legitimate software, attack versus no attack, okay? anomaly versus no anomaly. Sometimes unsupervised learning techniques are used, but they're not that much work on the area. This is still a very active research area I think we just submitted our first paper on this recently. So I won't talk about the clustering. There is also regression work in the machine learning, which uh, we won't be talking about. So we will be talking about the special classification problems. And it's very relevant for cybersecurity because we really want to do this good versus bad, uh, as I mentioned, spam versus non-spam. So here it means that uh, we want to categorize. That will be the, our main goal. So if you think about it, this is just for high level, for those who doesn't have too much machine learning, idea is that you, you try to have a function f, and you would hear this function f to be different things in different domains. Uh, how many people have heard about deep learning? Everybody, right? Oh, fantastic. OK, everybody knows that. So, so f could be a convolutional neural network with 12 layers, thousands of hidden units, for example. Or F could be a support vector machine. So the idea is that you will learn as some function F given a sample. It could be a malware network packet. It will predict an output. In our case, in classification case, we assume the outputs are discrete values. In other words, it could be attack, no attack. Or it could, if it's a malware, you could be talking about malware types. This is an obfuscator. This is a ransomware, and so on. So you try to classify into discrete things. And the usual assumption is that we have a training set. And the training set would be a set of samples you have the, represented in some domain, some feature domain, and its class value. From this, you, you minimize some or maximize some criteria. Uh, since everybody knows deep learning, right? If you think about deep learning, you, you try to optimize some type of or minimize some type of error. Uh, when, while you are uh, learning the set. And eventually, this model, learn model F, is uh, deployed, right, uh, for testing purposes on a new sample X to learn its predicted value. So this is a traditional standard machine learning classification work. So again, if you think about it, maybe you have some kind of network. I, I, I choose a network example, I guess. Like you, you see some packets in the network, packet traces. You extract some features, such as the, let's say, average packet length uh, or the time delay or something. Then you, you apply this uh, training labels with the training framework. And basically, you learn a model. Later on, in the deployment or testing phase, this model with extracted features are fed into the learned model, and you get the prediction. So now, what are the, what are the attacks? How the attacker try to beat these models? One type of attacks that comes is in the training time. So remember, we have a training sample. And this training sample has some instances. What happens if attacker can put some bad data points there? So this is called data poisoning. And of course, you may choose those data points. If you know what the function f that we try to learn, maybe we choose those points uh, so that it would do the most damage to f. Okay. The other, other uh, type of attacks we'll see uh, and discuss and fundamental results also is 
whatever what happens, attacker modifies the instance x to x prime. For example, if if we know if the attacker knows that we use average packet length to figure out whether something is attack or not, maybe it can add dummy bytes to change the or increase the packet size, for example. Or if we use this for spam, in addition to have uh, like a Viagra, maybe it can add some good words known to be associated with legitimate emails to change the instance. Uh, or if you do image classification to figure out some, uh, especially this is coming more into self-driving cars, and this is the very the recent very popular research going on in the cybersecurity community. Maybe you try to change the image in such a way that the dri self-driving car will not be able to recognize a stop sign. And then it can hit, for example. So now how you do it? You, may, you change x to x prime, the attacker modified somehow. So we will see fundamental results in both of these categories. So what can you do if you can attacker tries to attack at these points? Okay, uh, so this is, I think, 30, 40 years ago. Yes? So what is it you're assuming about what the attacker knows? Does, does it know my algorithm? Does it see my decisions in real time? Uh, so, that's a, so the question is what the attacker knows. And actually, a different, uh, different work assume different things about the attacker. But in a, in a nutshell, attacker can know the model. In some work, they assume attacker even knows some of the training data. Remember, we extract features. Some, most work assume that attacker knows the features. So, uh, of course, one argument is that we want to be secure even if attacker knows everything, like our model, some of the training data, and our features. But of course, in this case, it turns out, at least from some research, uh, high obfuscation <laughs> may help a little bit, makes attacker's job much harder. So these are the things. And then, uh, then the next thing is like what attacker can modify or how much. Again, that's uh, depending on the thing. So I think when we are talking different research or different work, summarizing, I think it should be clear. If not, let, let me know. I'll just explain. If I have, sure. If I have the ability to change x to, someone else, to something else, if I have the ability to change the data points, uh -huh. and so on, um, doesn't that already assume that I have uh, already all of the information about who, who I'm attacking? No, uh, this, not, not necessarily. For example, assume you're a spammer. Let's, I mean, you are not, but let's say you're a spammer, right? Okay. So you are. <laughs> How do you know? <laughs> <laughs> so you, are, you write a spam email, right? And then what you could do is that, and this is spammers usually do that. So they, send, they, ha they already have accounts on Amazon, sorry, Hotmail, blah, blah. And they send first spam emails to themselves and see whether it passes. So they can, and then they can control what they put in the spam email, right? So you can put so many nice things in it or some links, blah, blah. So it's under your control. But what's usually assumed is that you cannot control my legitimate emails. You cannot control the emails sent by the regular people. But you can control as a spammer all the spam emails. Similarly, you cannot really control, let's say, how Microsoft Office DLLs look like, but you can control how your malware calls DLLs or how your malware byte sequence looks like. So that's the control. And of course, as we talk more, some of the changing, some of the features, it will be much easier. Some of them will be much harder. And that's where, if there is hope, that's where it is. <laughs> uh, so this is uh, coming from, I think, 30, 40 years ago, when they look into uh, pack learning, which is one of the theoretical foundations of uh, some of the machine learning ideas. And then they look into this, some, the, uh, the work of from the training data. What happens if there is a malicious noise in the training data? And here, the assumption is that adversary, as I mentioned, like it changes from work to work. Here, for example, adversary knows everything. Adversary knows, target concept means the the phenomenon that we try to learn, the concept that we try to learn. Adversary know that. Adversary know the distribution of data. Adversary know the internal learning algorithm. Adversary knows everything. Furthermore, in this work, they look into unbounded computational resources. So adversary can do any computation 
to deceive the learning algorithm. So th in this work, the uh, author is looking to uh, how, what's the fundamental limit of learning if adversary can control entire training process. But of course, there is one limit. It's not surprising that right? if adversary just, if you have just noise, you can't learn anything. So the, 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 here, the, what adversary controls is this probability beta, in, which means that adversary can only corrupt certain proportion of the training set. So with probability beta, it can corrupt the, uh, an instance any way uh, he likes. Okay. Now, the goal is to really foil the learning algorithm by, by doing this. So now the question is, uh, under these scenarios, what is the largest value of beta that can be uh, tolerated by any learning algorithm? If you want to learn a uh, concept class C, think of concept class as uh, basically uh, the complexity about the learning problem. Or think about whether, for example, concept class could be a certain way of uh, distinguishing spam versus non-spam. So here, what's the upper bound on such learning? And then, uh, of course, this is unbounded uh, in terms of computation time. And they look into what happens if you have uh, a polynomial time algorithm for learning C. So in, in a kind of lower bound setting. Again, I want to, sorry. But uh, when you say that it's winning the adversary, right? It's, what does it mean? I mean some, it, isn't it some probabilistic? Uh, shouldn't it limit the some probability of success? So, so base, they will try to, but so uh, just to recap, pro adversary can corrupt any, uh, with probability beta, any of the instances. Right. But right? Then, and then you have to then we still want to learn a good classifier that can learn the class C. Exactly. How do you define if it's good or not? Isn't we it? will define it in a second. Right. So, and actually the formulas will look something like this. Okay. So it says that if, uh, if you want to learn an epsilon good hypothesis, in other words, you want to learn a classifier that has error rates of less than epsilon. So epsilon was part of the definition. Part of the definition. So you want to learn a good classifier, and that classifier one makes at most epsilon uh, errors. Epsilon is like with probability epsilon, it will make an error. <laughs> type 1, type 2 are in both sides. Like given a, here assumption is that we have two classes, right? Good and bad. So given something is good, the probability that it makes an uh, error is epsilon. Okay? And given something is bad, the probability that it makes an error is epsilon. So if you want to learn this, the, the uh, theorem says that the upper bound is it must be, it's this one, okay? Uh, so this is the, this bound holds regardless of time or sample complexity of the learning algorithm, uh, and even with uh, unbounded computational resources. So it's, they, they basically, I won't go into proof, but they show a concept class, they come up with an example of a, such a class uh, to find this upper bound. So in other words, the beta must be less than this value. And this is really closely tied to the epsilon. In other words, how good is your classifier? So, so there is a relationship with the beta that you can handle and the, and the class. So the other theorem that the, the, what they proved is that assume you have some kind of algorithm that learns this uh, separation of good and bad. And this algorithm use so many samples so in other words, you have an algorithm that gives epsilon good hypothesis. Remember, epsilon is the error rate. Epsilon is the error rate of the classifier. And it will give you a, actually, I have a point, I think. If you, and it will give you a, a OK. I'm not sure you I don't need to, I just need to use the laser pointer, actually. I don't want to block the projector. So it will uh, output a probability, good classifier with probability that is one minus delta. So in other words, if you want to, how many, this, for this classifier uh, to work and learn this, 
it requires this uh, many samples. Okay, uh, and this is the complexity, sample complexity. So in other words, this algorithm, polynomial time algorithm, requires this many instances. And the number of instances it needs depend on how good the classifier is and the success probability of learning this good classifier. And what they prove is that, uh, what they proved is that then uh, if, if you have this, uh, uh, if the beta depends on this setting. So here, what happens is that if you recall, you reduce the epsilon by eight and you reduce this delta to one half and you get the number of samples. And now we can withstand beta that is bounded by this value. In many cases, this is actually won't give you a tight results. Uh, but basically it says kind of, again, that's my interpretation as a non theoretician It says that uh, if you have enough number of samples, then you can increase the ring clearance to a higher beta. Okay. Uh, so the delta is half? So it less so yeah, it's, it's, it restricts delta to one half. So it less correctly, it's probably one half? Yeah. That's the sample. And then based on that S, it will be a minimum of these two. That's the beta it can stand. Remember, beta is the, well, how much the attacker, how many of the instances attacker can move by. Basically, uh, the bond depends on, uh, on these two. And I plug in for some numbers. For some numbers, it doesn't make a sense, like beta become bigger than one or something. So in some cases, it, it, it makes sense. So, but the, the, I think what, what, I, what uh, important thing is that this relationship. So there is a relationship between beta and the number of samples you have. Okay. Uh, therefore, uh, the, so if you think about this, if this is uh, increasing and, and there is a relationship in that respect. Uh, I, have the, I, I will have the slides and there are citations, so if you want to see the proofs, uh, I, I, it's there. So what are the summary? If you just, I, I, I think I have uh, mentioned that a little bit. So this is again, if you recall the setting, this is the de po de poisoning attack or, or the attack in the test the training time. And the attacker can change the samples we see in the training set, okay? And in this setting, basically, in a sense, uh, we, are we are saying that if you have large enough data and authentic ethical capabilities are bonded, still you can learn some concepts. So if the noise is limited, in a sense, uh, it's, this results kind of indicate that there is hope in then that even if the attacker can manipulate things. Uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't show those terms, but at least one interesting result for this work was that uh, you can have uh, better results if you have uh, access to both types of data. So you have positive or negative samples. Remember, we try to distinguish good and bad, so we have plus or minus, two classes. So if you have access to both classes, it turns out that the results are better. And what the reason I, I kind of mentioned this is this theoretical work from 30, 40 years ago is that uh, there is a uh, lots of uh, reasoning uh, relationship between learning with errors and this data poisoning attacks. Again, data poisoning attack is changing the data during the, uh, the training time. So now, this was the, the early work on a uh, foundational work on uh, the test time uh, attacks, so training time attacks. Now, the, one of the early work look into what happens if the attacker uh, change the data during the test time uh, to increase false negatives, basically. And we just talk about spam as an example. Intrusion detection, fraud detection is also in this category. What? Yes. Before you move to sure. Just ask you a question about because I have just one small uh, reservation with this model, sure. and that is 
here in this model you assume that the attacker can change data with some probability. Uh, yeah. Or, or this most of the results would have happened if the, attack, uh, if the attacker in advance changed the better portion of the training set. So you have a training set, 10,000 instances, and an attack beta is 0 0.1. What the attacker can do is change the, the classification of beta of, beta of, the, of the points. In, no, in this, effect. everything in the, of the point. So also the data itself? Data yeah. itself. Ah, okay. Okay. Data itself. It can change everything in this setting. Okay. Not just the, the classification. There are some work that look into that one as well. Okay, cool. uh, so this, yes? Does the polynomial time uh, learning algorithm also know the beta beforehand? Uh, no, it doesn't know the beta beforehand as well as I recall. It doesn't know the beta beforehand. But uh, as long the, the proof, if I recall correctly, goes around the fact that if you have enough good samples, uh, then you could be able to l still learn it. Uh, but as far as I know, attacker doesn't know the better. Sorry, the learning algorithm does, doesn't need to know better. But it, it will be successful with respect to better. So success will depend on better. So think of it like if you try to learn the average of something, right? So if there are so many good points, then you, your accuracy to average would be better. Uh, another more foundational result was about starting to, I think this is the first work that started to look into this game and try modeling this game between attacker. And here uh, the novelty was bringing in this cost. Now attacker m can manipulate the instances at the test time, but there is a cost. So. Uh, again, I'll, I'll try to give some basic ideas. Uh, but the assumption for classifier is that there is a cost for measuring the feature xi. Remember, we have uh, each instance we represent as something like x, a feature set. And here, assumption is that we have some cost for measuring. So now, as you see, this work try brings now the concept of cost. And, and also there is, of course, some utility. So the utility function is utility of classifying instance as YC with the true class Y. Clearly, if something is plus positive class, and if you, if you say something is positive, but if it's negative, you have a negative utility because you made a wrong decision. Of course, if you make correct decisions, you have a positive utility from classifier point of view. So if you have, of course, if you have a spam email and if you say num spam, that's bad. And if you have a legitimate email, they're sometimes called ham, I don't know why, but uh, then if you uh, have it uh, classified as spam, then you have a bad utility, for example. From, uh, what about the adversary? The adversary want to modify a positive instance. Positive means here, let's say spam, spam instance to, uh, let's say, uh, pass the classifier to look like a legitimate instance. So from attacker point of view, uh, here is the no newer part in a sense. Now for attacker, uh, there is a cost of changing a feature xi to xi prime. So that's the, uh, that's the crucial part. Because if attacker can change all the instance to anything it, it likes, it can just change it and match it to a good instance. So for example, but the question is then it won't be a spam. You see my point? I mean, you can just copy a good uh, email and it will pass the spam filter, but there is no utility for the spammer because spammer wants you to click on the link, spammer wants you to buy Viagra or whatever, right? So there is a cost of changing the features. So this is the, this is the uh, main, main point here. So now if, you have, if there's a, such a cost, and if we know attacker's cost, so that's another important part. So we know what is costly for attacker, what attacker uh, can change or cannot change. Now the same things, but from adversary's point of view, adversary wants to make a class that is positive. Positive means spam again in the setting. 
to look like negative. Negative means uh, legitimate email or positive, let's say malware, it looks like a, a legitimate software. Then it has a positive utility because it managed to pass a bad instance as a good instance. So it gets a positive utility. And if, if the classifier figures it out, it has a negative utility and it doesn't care in the other, other scenarios. In other words, it doesn't care what happens to good instances. Okay? So that's the, that's the assumption of this model. Why do you need the cost for, the, for changing features? I and mean, if there's a negative utility for, for not being able to deceive the classifier, then. No, but the attacker will, how, how the attacker will achieve this goal? is it will change its x to x prime. So what, there could be an x prime, which is already classified as negative. But from attacker point of view, the change of this cost could be much bigger than this increased utility. So it, it cannot use that. So therefore, it will be a play between the cost of change and the utility it's getting. So it will try to find changes that is still be below this utility, in a sense. The cost of those changes should be below this new utility it's getting. So in other words, like investment versus your return. So think of it changing features as your investment to pass the classifier. And if you pass the classifier, so it's actually, a, think of it like, uh, I think each spam email has a click rate of one in 1,000 or something. So and then when you sell as Viagra, there is some certain, let's say, gain. So that's your utility. But changing email and may reduce your click rate from one in 1,000 to one in 10,000, let's say. So then it may not worth that email because of the low response rate. So something like that. So, so the, the cost yeah. for the classifier, I should think of as uh, <coughs> Verifying that my decision is correct. Right? Sometimes this comes into play uh, when you have, like, in some cyber physical systems also. Uh, for example, in in army, let's say you are getting a sensor reading, and you may want to verify it by sending a drone, for example. So that could be a like, let's say there is a sensor that says there is someone here. Now you want to verify it, and then you send a drone to take a picture, for example. So that can be a cost in some scenarios. But in many t settings, like in spam, there may be no cost in measuring the thing. But the cost will happen when you make a wrong decision in that scenario. Right? So if, if there's a legitimate evil, it's put into spam filter. That's the utility. Ut yeah. yeah. The yeah, utility. Is, the cost is the, the, the measurement. So the way I, in my, at least the way I see it is that your utility is a combination of costs versus benefits. Right? So, I mean, actually, this is the utility of classifying. So, we, I mean, when you, we will, I think I have the equations here. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the, all the equations. But basically, we need to look at our total thing, right? Yeah, of course. Of course. Total so utility. The cost yeah, total utility involves the utility from the classification and the cost. Yes. So, when yeah. you talk about the adversary's cost, can you give examples of what? The, the, the cost, this one? Yeah. Okay. So one, uh, uh, in the spam world, the cost could be is the uh, reduction in uh, the click rate, for example. Maybe you change your spam email in such a way that it's not spam anymore. In the other world, or in the network setting, the cost could be is that if you send, assume you, you have a botnet, and in your botnet, you can send thousands of spam emails per day. But in order to reduce your capture thing, you send less emails per day. Now it reduces your profit. Okay? Or if you are doing a malware and you want to extract some data, in order to prevent capturing, maybe you extract less data with your malware in your, when you hack into a new system. So it will reduce your per day amount of data that you can extract. So those are potential costs, I would say. The utility function is defined only on the classes themselves, I see. Uh, that's uh, basically, that's the reason I, I missed that one. I should have maybe the total utility. Uh, 
uh, I don't have it here. No, not the total utility. Total utility, of course, does. But, but this utility depends only on the class, not on the specific instance. No. Uh, but okay. per instance, you compute it. So it actually becomes this oh. probability here. So you would be doing something like this. So conditional utility is, and then you, you do an expected utility. So it's for each specific value. Yeah. Okay, so you don't assume that you have the same value for all the... So, but for each uh, label, for each instance, you have the utility for that instance, and then you do an expected conditional for x, and then you, you look at your expected utility. I will have another version that will UC give you... Defined, the UC, the input to UC is just the classes. Yes. Just the classes. Uh, it's like if you look at spam, it's, it's not the same utility for two different messages. But here you just simplify, and if I understand correctly, you simplify and say, if I have spam and it was uh, considered as, as uh, non-spam, then I get this utility, regardless of the specific value. Sure. So, so basically, think of it this way. Like you have many instances, x1, y1, right? Mm -hmm. For this instance, my utility will depend as a classifier whether I make correct decision or not. Only on that. On that, yes. Because, uh, uh, of the course, the so there are some work that tries to look at it, especially this comes into play when you have credit card transactions. Okay? So for spam or non-spam, usually this is quite valid. Okay? But in some scenarios, such as credit card transaction, assume you swap a card, and you have a $1,000 transaction versus $10 transaction. Yeah. So your cost of mistake then would be different, it's right? Yes, that's, that's, that's a scenario too. In this work, it's assumed only per instance exactly. for, for this work. And then you, you, you basically look at the expected, in this scenario, you look at this expected UC basically. And this is still only per class? Per, per class in this setting, yes. When you equal the uh, utility of something negative, say negative, and something positive becoming negative. Which one? To zero, uh, bottom right. This one? No. Negative in this scenario means is a good class, okay? As an attacker, I don't care whether good class is misclassified as bad or good classified is, is still classified as good. Because as a spammer, let's say, this is spam setting, I don't care what happens to legitimate emails because I won't sell more Viagra. But it would mess up their classifier. It, 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 in this setting, the classifier is fixed anyway. So this is the test time. Okay. So the classifier is deployed. So the goal here is to pass the classifier. Remember, we are, we are looking at two broad set of attacks, like one in the training, one in the test. This is the test setting. Uh, so, in, in this work, they look at uh, one step at a time. And again, to uh, answer questions here, it assumes that everybody knows everything. So all parameters of both players are known to each other. And they've done this for something called naive Bayes. This is like, again, everybody knows, looks like long machine learning anyway. Uh, but it's the, like the first thing you teach as an example, right, in machine learning classes that is taught. Uh, and the main idea is that given instance x, you try to look at the probability of its positive versus negative. If this ratio is bigger than some certain threshold based on the utilities, you classify it as positive. Okay? And how do you compute these probabilities? In naive Bayes' world, it's assumed independence. And it has a very simple linear-like formula to do this. Like it, it becomes like a weighted f linear function, actually. Uh, so, uh, so adversaries' optimal strategy in this setting is that uh, they, they have two assumptions in their work. They have the complete information and classifier is an, uh, unaware of its presence. So, so they look at one step at a time. So given classifier, attacker attacks the classifier. Given an attack, you update your classifier and they play this game for a while and see where it goes. Okay. Uh, and here it comes, the transformation cost is less than the expected utility. That's the attacker's goal. 
It tries to modify the features so that the transformation cost is less than expected. It turns out that, uh, of course, the, our other goal is that new instance is classified as negative. So in order to do that with minimum cost, it becomes an integer linear program. Uh, I skipped that program here. Uh, and this way you can, so given this classifiers, naive base classifier, and given these utility functions here, you can write this, uh, at this as an optimal uh, problem and find the optimal solution for given x. Why is it, why is it necessary that the classifier is unaware of the presence of x? Because they, they couldn't solve the equilibrium directly if you know Nash equilibrium. It was very hard to compute Nash equilibrium in this scenario because you're a complex classifier and the classifier space is very big. And, and so on, so they kind of compute the best response functions. So if you uh, know, like in, in sometimes in game theory, you have best response functions. Like given this, what's my best response? Yeah. So yeah. this is basically best response function. Given classifier strategy, what's my best response? Yeah. Okay. okay, and usually sometimes in, in order to compute equilibria, you use best response functions. So this is something like that. So in other words, this, I don't know whether this discussion was clear. This is like, given a classifier, what's the best attack I can do? And now, the other thing they solved is, given an attack, what's the best classifier against that attack? Okay, and then they compute that too. Here, the assumption is that adversary uses the optimal strategy. By the way, this is the number one criticism uh, always uh, cybersecurity practitioners come back, uh, saying that how do you know uh, the attacker is always such an intelligent, they do the optimal thing, they may do suboptimal, they are human, they have biases, and so on. So this is a big assumption there. Uh, and the training set is not tempered by the adversary. If you look at it here, the assumption is that there is no attack in the training set. Remember, the previous theoretical result was an attack in the training set, but here uh, we don't. And then, and then, if, what it does is that it tries to make a prediction that maximizes the conditional utility. Okay? Because this x may have been modified, so we try to make a prediction that maximizes this uh, conditional utility with a post adversary conditional probability. So it's assuming is that uh, what is the, if this is positive, what is the probability that we see x prime? And the original x may be modified to x prime. So, okay, how it could happen? If, what is the, if this is an element of positive class, what is the probability of seeing an x? And what is the probability of x is converted to x prime? So this is the conditional uh, adversarial probability. So what is the probability that it will be converted? And this probability is actually become uh, based on the utility, and it's not continuous. Uh, because some instances will never be changed, and some instances will be changed. So, so this work looks, start looking at this uh, adaptive behavior, and there are follow-up work uh, that start looking into uh, uh, how to use this game theory and other things to choose features. So uh, if you recall, or uh, two slides summary of machine learning, in many scenarios, we extract features and we use those features to build machine learning models. And here, uh, this is a slightly different model. The other one was kind of each act one at a time. Here, uh, this is something called Sekalberg game, also called leader follower games in uh, game theory. Uh, here, the, the assumption is adversary chooses an action. I will explain what that action space. And after observing this action, the data miner chooses, or machine learning builder, model builder chooses an, another action. And you have specific utility functions, which I will define. Uh, so given these utility functions, we have this game, and now we can look at uh, the uh, probabilities in this game. So here, the assumption is that you have a mixture model and with two classes, again, good and bad. 
most of the work assumes two class as here. Good class, bad class, spam, and spam, and so on. Here, but it assumes a mixture model. What is mixture model is that the, the distribution, probable distribution of X depends on two mixtures. These are mixing probabilities that sum up to one. And this is conditional PDF, conditional probability distribution functions. Given uh, it's in one class, this is a conditional probability and vice the same here. And here, what adversary in this model does is adversary applies some certain type of transformation to transform this bad class conditional distribution to something else. And now you can, you can really write the utility functions. Remember we were discussing about utility functions, how you write them and so on. Here, if you look at this, uh, assume uh, you, you have the original classify, original class, now it's modified. If attacker can, if data miner or machine learning model can observe this changed, you can write the optimal class, class uh, optimal classifier and the cost of this optimal classifier. Again, the assumption here is the same and the cost will depend on classifying uh, one as one versus one as two and vice versa. So it's again similar to the previous one. The cost for per instance depends only whether you correctly lab label them or not. From this, you can write its utility and just for mathematical reasons, it's a minus of this. So now you can come up with equations uh, that, that can tell well you are doing things. And these regions, the integral of these regions are taken based on the optimal classifier, based on the, this uh, classifier H. And of course, uh, so this is the cost for classifying X to class I, given that it's in class J or label J. And of course, the goal is to minimize this uh, loss or maximize utility. Uh, so here again, transformation as a cost. Uh, so you can write it and you can write a formula of it again. So basically, from attacker point of view, there is some certain gain after transformation. You can write it as an equation, another utility function. And then eventually, you can solve them. Uh, and uh, this will be your uh, Sekelberg sub-perfect equilibrium. But of course, it, it wouldn't be surprising, I think, to say that this, solving this for general scenarios is very, very hard. High dimension space. You can only solve it for uh, certain cases. Uh, but the interesting, at least, uh, I think, result of this is, uh, I'll just skip some of the equations. Uh, so it's uh, basically, you, c you can write it as, uh, some sort of uh, expected uh, values. Uh, I have a about the sure. Can you kind of motivate it? I mean, I, what is a bit weird to me, maybe in understanding, is, is the fact that doesn't it assume that the, you have the complete knowledge of yes. the adversary's action? Uh, Everything complete knowledge. It? Sorry? So can you so both of the work assume complete knowledge at this point. The motivation of this is... No, assuming that the, we have complete knowledge of the adversary's action, that's a bit weird to me. If we have complete knowledge of what the adversary is doing, how can we uh, motivate it? Okay, yes. So the, the argument for this is that what happens, how, I mean, here the, the argument is what would be the equilibrium look like? So if you have the complete knowledge of the adversary, uh, but ad remember adversary in this scenario is the leader. Adversary, so what you are doing is that, assume if I do this as an adversary, attack, uh, the defender will do this, okay? So that, what's my best option? What's that? So this is good to analyze adversary's best option in a sense. So under the best action of the adversary, what we can do as a defender? This is to explore this scenario. Yeah, so adversary moves first in this setting. I will have a variant of it, but again, it's assumed complete information. Both of the, all of this work assumes complete information. The previous one also had the complete information about adversary when it's building the active classifier, like a best response. But the idea, again, 
what I will do is that when, when I finish this area, I think uh, these, these are more theoretical things, but it has some, I think, interesting ideas about practice as well, but this is, I would say, thought exercises. Okay. Uh, in, in actually, there is so much uncertainty in practice, no one knows everyone else, but this is under perfect conditions what, what's happening and understanding that. So, okay, so the, uh, all this game theory equilibria solving uh, from this point of view at least kind of says that uh, you need to, it gives insight about how to choose attributes or features for adversarial learning. So, of course, the first thought was to choose the most predictive attributes. So the attributes that can separate good versus bad, like Viagra may be a good example of a predictive attribute, let's say. Or you remember we have cost for an attribute that is hardest to change. So what this the results sh show, at least in this scenario, is let's look at this one simple setting. Assume these, we have three attributes or three features. This is like normally distributed. Okay, so if you think about it, if, if you look at this feature, these two classes are very separated. Think of this is normal with mean one and variance one, and this is mean four and variance one. So if you think about it, it's like uh, quite separated distributions. Again, this is normal distribution, so it's like one is like this, the other like this, so here it's at one, here it's at four. So these two classes are much more separated on this, uh, third, on this dimension. If you look at the second one, in the second one it's closer, 3.5 here, so it's closer, and the first one is, let's say, three. So if you look at just uh, the, the most predictive or the best attribute, if you choose one, it's the third one because these two classes are more separated. This is again normal distribution mean one and mean four. If you, if you draw that, it's, it will be something like this. Uh, but if you look at penalty, in other words, from attacker point of view, which feature is harder to change, that's the first one, because that has, for various assumptions, this is just an example, we, we assume that this is the hardest to change. So if you go with the most predictive, you may choose this feature. If you go with the hardest one, you may choose this feature. But actually, all these assumptions and lots of math, uh, this, this paper has 20 pages of so, kind of, when you look at equilibrium, you would see that actually this is your best bet and this gives you the, the least error, this feature. Why? Because it's a right combination of hard to change and predictiveness. So all this theory, at least some one practical example is that when you are looking at the features you are changing, you need to consider two things at a, at a time. Like how predictive or how useful that feature and what are the attacker potential manipulations to that. So this has, I think, important implications in some practical domains and therefore What's this two theoretical papers says in a sense? Uh, looking at the cost is important. And while you are looking at it, you also look at the predictiveness together to choose the right set of features. Other than that, I think most of them is just theoretical exercises, as you, sh you mentioned, not very practical assumptions. But I think the bringing the cost and this how to choose attributes are more realistic or practical insights from these two work. Okay. Uh, now, in this one, uh, now the question is, in the previous game, the adversary goes first and, uh, and the attacker uh, and the defender goes second. So now the question is, what happens if you change the order? So here, similar setting, still similar utility functions, but here the data miner choose an action A1 or a model. Then adversary choose, observe this model completely and choose an action. And then you, the game ends with payoffs to each player. And again, you have some utility functions. I will 
describe what those utility functions are. The utility functions here are defined based on the samples or a sample set. Again, uh, here uh, the same uh, things apply in this work as well. Uh, where, uh, so let's look at this. Uh, here the learner is minus one and the adversary is plus one, the underscore. Here the cost utility function again will depend on the cost of changing the data set D to this D dot point or whatever, this one. And it has some constraints, constants. From, uh, in this scenario, from the learner point of view, again, there's a loss function. If given x prime, you make a prediction, and if it's long, there's some kind of loss function for it. And again, it has uh, some kind of similarly uh, in the previous settings, if it's class one and if it's two, class two, what's the co cost of it? One interesting thing is that there is some kind of regularization factor for this W, and this is the parameters used for the classifier uh, in this setting. Uh, so the Segalberg games work like this. Learner decides on W. This is a linear classifier. So the classifier will be something like Wx is bigger than C, for example. So this is our classifier. So the attacker, so the learner decides on the W here. And after that, adversary observes W and modifies the data. And the, uh, it's loss given by Dell is searching for a sample that leads to the global minimum lost. Okay, uh, so adversary f tries to find this set given the W that has the minimum lost. Again, it's assumed to solve an optimization function. Uh, now, still, you can talk about uh, equilibrium here, and you can try to learn find the W, okay, and uh, given uh, you find the minimum W, and given W, the attacker finds the, uh, the one that has this maximum loss here for this, uh, for it. And we want to find such a W prime. Again, it becomes an optimization problem. And, uh, we, we really want to find the W star that, uh, that minimizes the costs and, uh, and the corresponding to this optimal uh, response by the attacker. So here the order has changed. So basically they, are, they kind of solve this two level optimization problem with uh, this min max thing and uh, they show that this exists and solvable in some scenarios. And, uh, and this is applicable when the adversary is rational as usual. Uh, and the predictive model is known to the adversary. So the adversary knows exactly the machine learning model used in this setting. Uh, so this is some examples of the more theoretical part. Of course, uh, as you see, this has many, many assumptions, these things, and doesn't look very practical. So the next level of work was on, can we bring some of these insights from this theoretical stuff into building more practical machine learning techniques? Okay, so what are those techniques? Again, one is called adversary support mach machine learning. Again, if you remember, uh, or for those who don't remember support vector machine, it has tries to find a hyperplane that has the highest separation margin. What it means is that it tries to find this, so assume these are your data points in your training set, it tries to find such a hyperplane that separates these this two classes, so this distance from these classes is the highest. Okay. It cannot always find such a clear plane and there are some kind of penalties for it. But that's the that's traditional support vector machine learning. And now, of course, here we assume that there is still an attack. So here, uh, 
again, uh, if you recall, both of the previous theoretical stuff, at least the test time ones, were about the cost for attacker, how much it changes, and so on. And in many scenarios, we don't, we don't exactly know how, it, how much it can change or what can the attacker do. Here, the assumption is that we don't know what exactly the attacker can do, but we assume some limits on it. In other words, we can say that attacker can move any malicious point in the domain under some certain constraints. So this delta ij is how much can attacker add to a, any instance, OK? And that is, uh, that is bounded by some certain constraints per feature. So now we are assuming, again, there is assumption. We don't know exactly what the attacker can do. But we assume that there are some certain limits on attacker actions. Okay, And this is, uh, here the assumption is that attacker has a target. This is kind of mimicry attack. An attacker can choose any point it likes, and it can move closer to it. But again, under some certain restrictions, these are, some of it is a little bit for mathematical reasons. But uh, there, so in other words, you, you don't know what the attackers do. You don't know attacker utilities. But you put some limits on the attacker of how much it can modify the data. So when you do this, what you can do is that if you, if you recall, I mean, you don't, I should have put the original one, actually, next time. The traditional uh, support vector machine, or SVM, before, uh, before deep learning was cool, that was one of the uh, most popular techniques, still it's used uh, heavily uh, for uh, many domains. And what it does is that it tries to learn a classifier uh, that, that, that has this constraint. You want it to be sparse as much as possible. And these are the errors. Uh, in other words, if you cannot separate it directly, and there is this constant C here. So you, you kind of solve this optimization problem, and there are some constraint on epsilon in the traditional support vector machine. Here, in this model, now you change this traditional support vector machine with the assumption that what you see may be modified by the attacker. And those CF is basically coming from the previous uh, assumption about attacker capabilities. So here, in order to have a more robust setting, we don't know exactly what attackers do, but we, we assume that attacker can modify it somehow. And we bring that knowledge into classifier building and try to make it more resistant and solve this optimization. And similarly, uh, for other type of uh, scenario, you could rewrite the classifier optimization problem. So what would have happened is that, uh, just to give an example, what these optimizations would look like is, this is assume uh, what the tradition, this is your data initially. If you run a traditional SVM, it will learn this classifier, OK? And this classifier is basically separating this good versus bad, OK? But now, after some attack happened, in real life, you would have, in the de deployment, you will see that some of these dots further modified and moved beyond this boundary more and more. When you run this adversarial version, which assumes that attacker has certain uh, future modification capability, you would start with the blue line. This would be the, what the adversarial SVM would have learned. Okay? And now, as you see, it's more inside and farther away from the bad points. So it tries to anticipate potential movements of the attacker. Of course, that parameter is important. If, you, if the parameter is, was bigger, then the blue line would, would be further here, and it would make it uh, problematic when there is no attack. So now, all these game theoretical assumptions can reduce it to a simpler assumption, which is, what's the attacker maximum capability? And you consider this, and uh, you try to uh, find this point. And of, for those who know one-class SVMs, uh, this is actually performed much, much better than one-class SVM, because still you use the training set 
of the attacker and attacker capabilities. So this is like one example to try to modify existing techniques to be more resistant. So you, you kind of have this optimization problem tied to attack models. Again, you don't know exactly what attacker do. You don't know attacker utility. You don't know anything about the attacker. But you have an assumption about per future attacker can modify it this much. And you can show that this is more resistant than traditional SVM against the attacks. This is one model of attackers. Another more robust technique, again, done in the SVM setting is uh, about uh, uh, what happens attacker that are missing and corrupted features. Similar scenario, again, we have a linear classifier W. And, uh, and this is intercept. This is B <laughs> here, let's say. OK. And now you learn uh, on, again, uncropped training data. Here are the assumptions in those models where the training data was good. Uh, so you learn a classifier with these features. But during test time, attacker attacks and maybe delete some of the features. So here the assumption is that attacker may hide some of the features. In the previous one, attacker modifies the features, changes them. In this one, attacker hides or hides some of the features. Now the question is, how can you make your SVM more robust? And of course, the solution is very similar. It will change the optimization. and. Uh, and of course, in this case, at attacker's power must be uh, bounded. Because if attacker can hide all the features, you can't do anything. So now, how many features it can hide? Uh, you can assume that attacker must leave at least some subset in J of features. And you can make it, uh, you can have some penalty or value for features. And you can make sure that it's bigger than P, for example. So there is some kind of, sorry. Is per, per item? Per, per item. Okay, so in each item you can corrupt up to two features. Two features, or you can have more complicated one, like weighted some type of thing. So it can corrupt at most this much weight, or change at most this much weight, but per, per, per instance. Uh, so this is uh, like worst case, uh, again, uh, empirical risk on training set and they write uh, an SVM like formalization. But in this scenario, under this constraint, there is this exponential growth on the constraint set. So they do some mathematical tricks to use the duality transform uh, and they, uh, they show that this modified equations, again, I won't go into details, uh, can be used this online to batch algorithm. They give an algorithm to learn in this scenario. Uh, so basically, the, these are a couple of examples where you don't exactly know uh, the attacker utility functions. You assume some restrictions on attacker capabilities to come up with more robust learning techniques. Uh, there is also other work called uh, Acre Learning, which I will briefly touch, that try to make uh, things more robust. And especially this is coming from this positive or active attacks. Here, the, uh, in, this, in the spam especially, this work, look at the spam scenario. There are passive attacks such as like random dictionary words or most frequent dictionary words. So you add these words to the spam uh, email so that you, you, it will classify it as good email. And you, know, you can just throw in from dictionary or English words. These are passive attacks. Uh, and then for a given classifier, you may maybe query the spam filter to find the, uh, the f good words. What are the good words or what are the possible best words? So they look at this type of attacks. And uh, they call it uh, uh, this called active classifier reverse engineering. And the idea is that 
uh, you, have, you have again some kind of cost function and you want to, to, uh, to find an instance that will be classified as here negative means again good if you recall at least in this setting. And here this, uh, this is the cost of the instance. So you have given one positive and one negative sample and now you want to find a new sample that will bypass the classifier. So you can use this to understand the classifier and you can use this to bypass the classifier. And then you can do querying to the classifier. Is this point will be good or bad? Is this point classified good or bad? So now you are trying to learn and poke the classifier to find uh, the the new instance. Uh, they show that if your classifier is linear, uh, even though you don't know exactly the classifier, but you can come up with a good uh, approximation after uh, polynomial samples. Uh, and then, uh, and then uh, they have also results like if the features are Boolean, then you have two learnable if the uniform linear cost functions. So in other words, even if you don't know the exact classifier, you can find instances that pass the classifier quite uh, quickly. Uh, these uh, work, yes? This is assuming that you know the features? Yes, you know all the features. You know all the features. I mean, you know the feature set. Uh, of course, all this work uh, assumed a single type of adversary. Uh, now the question is, what happens if you have a classifier and you have multiple type of adversaries? So with different cost functions, different capabilities. Uh, that, that's, uh, that was the focus of this work. So this is the uh, typical setting, but now you have multiple adversaries that can uh, do different type of attacks. It can, some of them can be attacking randomly or it can have different cost functions for different instances. So uh, typically we showed scenario, we've seen scenarios where we have single leader, single follower. Now the question is what happens if you have a single leader or multiple followers or multiple attackers? So in this framework, what, what, what's been done is you have a leader and you have, a let's say, the learning model. So these are the bad guys in the slides from Star Wars Universe. Uh, so now the, the typical framework solved this optimization problem. You have a single learning model and there is one type of attacker corrupting or manipulating the data and we've seen some examples of solving this. Now, if you have multiple attackers, what could be the best strategy? And the attackers may have different types, different costs. It turns out that uh, what you could do is you could use the single leader, single follower strategies for each uh, setting. Again, this is similar to what we discussed, similar kind of optimization framework that you try to maximize the uh, adversary plays, uh, try to have utility function uh, and maximize learner's loss and minimize adversary's loss type of scenario. Uh, so here, uh, this, this Bayesian Sarkarberg game assumes that all followers know the leader strategy when uh, optimizing their rewards. So the leader strategy is no. Uh, leader uh, uh, pure strategy consists set of learning functions uh, of this form. And then uh, followers uh, transform instances by adding this delta x in this scenario. And here, the most important thing is that there are this uh, kind of payoff matrices uh, for the leader and the follower for different type of uh, mixed strategy setting. And uh, uh, the leader is first, it makes a decision and then the follow, and then the leader important thing is that doesn't know the exact type of adversary, 
while solving these problems. And the followers play their optimal responses to them. Uh, so in this framework, what, hap what will happen is that the attacker, the, the, class, uh, the classifier, will learn, uh, the data miner or machine learning will learn many different classifiers, each of them optimized with respect to different type of attackers. But then in the test time, this is, this I find it uh, interesting, is that uh, it randomizes. So it turns out that randomizing which classifier to use is an effective mechanism against different type of adversaries. So when the instance is X come, with probability P2, maybe classifier 2 will be used. With probability Pn, the classifier Cn will be used. So now you learn different set of classifiers resistant to different type of adversaries, but you mix them randomly. And this turns out that gives you a better, more robust result than having just one classifier. So randomization in also classification looks like help in, uh, when you're deploying classifier. So uh, let, this is, I think, more fun part starting now. <laughs> no more equations, uh, so uh, promise. I try to skip the equation as much as possible, as quickly as possible. But to summarize till this point, you have seen a bunch of equations. Some of them didn't make sense because I didn't cover some of them. But the intuition was on three points. Let's model the attacker. Let's model the machine learning builder or data miner. Let's model their costs. Based on these three things, let's come up with different, uh, better classifiers. Let's come up with techniques to choose features that are more robust. And most of them focused on SVMs because they are, you can write an optimization and solve these things. Now, remember we talk about cybersecurity. We never, we, I didn't touch any <laughs> cybersecurity at this point because it's more about the fundamental techniques. Uh, let's start seeing how machine learning has applied. Uh, I have, I think, 15 more minutes, right? I think now is the coffee plant. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh. Okay, it's a good point, yes. <laughs>